My guest today is Douglas Starnes. Douglas, how you doing? I'm great, David. How are you? I'm doing real well. How's everything in Memphis, Tennessee? Uh, well, it's a lot drier than it was supposed to be. For the second time in a row, we had big rain chances, and the rain just skipped right over us. <laughs> is that good? Um, we've had a lot of rain recently, actually. So uh, it's kind of interesting, the earthworms. I think it's actually too wet for the earthworms because after a rain, it's like the patio gets invaded. <laughs> with earthworms and then they can't uh, excellent. make it back then the, then they can't make it back to the to to the lawn and i have to pick them up before they become dog snacks <laughs> i don't have that issue <laughs> in my high rise here <laughs> yeah uh what do you do douglas so i uh my day job is uh i'm a technical author and um you could say i'm a content creator i use the two terms interchangeably, but I create um, instructional materials for uh, technology professionals and software developers. Do work for Pluralsight, uh, do work for a company out of Canada called uh, Real Python, mm -hmm. and uh, then also I publish some of my own stuff as well. Excellent. Uh, you've been a Python guy since I've known you. Uh, in fact, yeah. I, I met, we originally met at a, at a .NET conference, and you were like the guy talking about Python. <laughs> Yeah, um, I've been doing, so I, I first discovered Python probably 2005-ish around there, but I've been, but I've been using it uh, seriously since around 2010, I guess you could say. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a one-trick pony. I also, I also do, I also very much a big fan of .NET, mm -hmm. uh, um, I, the mobile languages, uh, so uh, Swift and Kotlin, uh, Dart, I've been, get, I've been doing, I've uh, been messing with, uh, working with Flutter as well, mm -hmm. um, and uh, other things. So no, but Python, but Python is my, is my go-to language. It's right. just, um, people, you know, ask me, what can you do with Python? And I'll say the correct answer is or the correct question rather is what can't you do with python there's yeah. it's so versatile it's so um so flexible and it and it and you can touch so many different things with it and you found that it has a place in microsoft azure uh absolutely uh microsoft actually even before what I what I refer to as the open source reformation of 2014, uh, when they when they when, <laughs> That's when, about when, when, when I joined when, Microsoft, <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when it was when, when you know Scott Guthrie came out and shocked the world, we're open sourcing .NET. Uh, but even before then, Microsoft was very heavily involved in the Python community, sponsoring Python conferences. I remember mm -hmm. going back to a Python conference back as early as 2011, and Microsoft mm -hmm. not only sponsored, but had a speaker there, somebody from Microsoft speaking about Python. So um, it's really no surprise that uh, Python is one, of the, is, is one of the best supported languages on Azure, and in fact, there are some places in Azure where Python is better supported than even .NET. So, um, but uh, so so some of the machine learning um, services and data services, such as Azure Machine Learning, Azure Databricks, um, those are places where you would expect to see uh, languages like Python or R uh, more why, than why is .NET. That? Um, <clears throat> Python has always been. A very strong language in the machine learning and data science community. Um, I personally believe it's because data scientists and machine learning engineers is more like they're math geeks first and software engineers second. And uh, Python is just a language that you know I, I always say when I do my Python 101 talk I always tell people you can become dangerous in a weekend and useful in a week uh, if you already know another language because it's it's, it's very simple uh, people say I can keep it in my head. You're not going to spend, uh, you know, it's very clean syntax. The, you know, you don't have curly braces all over the place. Right. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's very simple, very clean. It's not, uh, you're not going to spend your time in the docs saying, okay, you know, how, how do I form this particular construct, everything. And, uh, therefore it's easy, it, you know, it's, it's easy for people to pick up. Uh, so if you, so you, and, and there are pe many people who are even outside of, uh, realms you know you'll have you'll have like, like an economist or somebody who you know it's you know just people who are domain or subject matter experts or domain experts who will use python to um to accomplish what they need in fact ipython now jupiter and the what later became jupiter notebook 
was actually started um, by a uh, what is it? A computational, either computational physicist or biologist, however, Dr. Fernando Perez, out at UC Berkeley, and not he, not a computer scientist. No, no, no. He's not a computer scientist, and he just and he just said, "Hey, I've, he's, he was using Python for for his for his research, and he saw some shortcomings." Or, or some or some needs that need to be filled and he just started to create these this little tool together and now he hmm. has ended up uh, keynoting the international PyCon conference several times I believe and um, so he and, and but, but but yeah he's not a computer scientist yeah I've run into when I used to go to a lot of user groups uh, there's a couple of Python groups here in Chicago mm -hmm. and I would run into people that were like getting their PhD in archaeology or something like that <laughs> and they, they just they needed some way to present their data and mm -hmm. so they'd learned Python and <laughs> it was it was relatively simple to pick up yeah it, it, exactly like I said like I said dangerous in a weekend and useful in a week <laughs> yeah. uh, what kind of things are you doing with it uh, particularly in the cloud so what so what I'm doing is as a um, is is as a you know like I said um, technical author mm -hmm. and also um, also also most also Microsoft most valuable professional so I'm you know trying to push the uh, so trying to advocate for the uh, for the Microsoft products as much as possible Thank you um, for that. <laughs> and, and, and and I really do believe and I really do believe it's the it, it, that Azure is the best of the clouds I really do but um, what I'm trying to do is I'm tr is, is, is I many times I'll get a lot of I didn't know you could do that with Python and Azure you know, people, people, they assume that it's, you know, because it says Microsoft on it, that it's .NET first. And when, in fact, yeah, and when, in fact, of course, the, stat, the statistic has been out there many times that there are more Linux VMs than Windows VMs on, on Azure. Right. Um, so what, so what I'm trying to do is I have this, is I um, actually began doing this talk, uh, it was about a year ago. Um, I called it um, Taming Snakes, uh, Taming Snakes in the Microsoft Cloud. Okay. And snakes it was being about, the Python, right, right, <laughs> right. The snakes being the Python, and um, it was it was about what you can do with uh, Python and about with Python and Azure. And one of the reasons I was doing this is because um, this is during this is kind of during one of the, the 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 pandemic was still going on, and I was having people get I was having trouble getting people to speak at my Python user group. People didn't want to speak virtually, and. Um, so I was saying, you know, here's what you can do because 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 Azure has a very generous free tier. Uh, you get what is it? There's like three levels of it. First, you know, you just you just for showing up, you get like two hundred dollars for thirty days uh, to spend on anything you want, and then for a year, you get um, a, a very generous quota of other services such as da databases and uh, databases, virtual machines, and such. And then even after that's over, you can still there there there's some services that are free forever, and you could actually you know run a you know it's it's enough to experiment with, but mm -hmm. you could actually run uh, small applications for in theory forever uh, mm -hmm. on Azure uh, with that with that free tier. So I was trying to tell people you don't have to put a lot of you know you don't have to put a lot of um, uh, money into this. All you're really all you're really spending is time, and trying to encourage people to go out there build something. And come back to the group and present it and tell us what and tell us what you learned. And um, in Azure and Python, you know, and Azure was the was the perfect vehicle for that. And then also combine that with Visual Studio Code, um, which uh, really interesting. Another really interesting thing, even though it's a Microsoft product, um, it you know, basically and I say this is kind of a backhanded compliment to Visual Studio Code, but out of the box, it's actually kind of boring. It doesn't really do a whole heck of a lot. It's basically a text right. editor with a terminal and Git and, and Git support. But, but it the, supports all these plugins. Exactly. That's what gives. That's what gives Visual Studio Code the power. Is um, I haven't. I didn't check today what the number is, but last I checked, it was over thirty thousand plugins. So you can basically make this thing do almost whatever you want based on these plugins. Right. And the most popular one, and in fact, not only the most popular one, but three out of the top four. Are Python related? I did not know this. Yeah, yeah. The the, the most popular one, and last I checked, there's like over 40 million downloads. Uh, the it actually the so that would be the Python extension. That's the one that gives you all of your tooling. Uh, so things like virtual environment support, testing and debugging, um, and and um, what allows you to um, and it gives you several uh, pre-configured uh, for popular uh, frameworks. It gives you several pre-configured templates for uh, like Django and stuff. Um, 
but uh, that and then also Jupyter Notebook support. Uh, I mentioned IPython earlier, which uh, became Jupyter Notebook. Essentially, Jupyter Notebook allows you to have a Python session running in a web page, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, very, it's very nice because you don't have to keep on but what it is has a um, has a series of what's called cells, and you put some Python code in the cell and you execute it, and you go on to the next one and execute it. And what happens is you can always go back later and edit what you did and um, and and see and, and see the updates. And these are really nice because, like I said, they're at, uh, they're rendered in a web page or rendered in a browser, but they're actually stored in the JSON file. Even even any images or visualizations, they actually store it in in a in a JSON file. Hmm. And if you if you upload one of these to a GitHub repo, it'll render it in it'll render it in GitHub when you when you visit that file in GitHub. So this is really and since and since it's just text, since it's just text, you can put you can pull request you can fork these, submit pull requests, uh, and you can also but also you can render these or, or not not just render them but execute them inside of Visual Studio Code. Right. And that's that's yeah. that, that's that second that's that second most popular extension. And then there's one called PyLance, which is a kind of a static type checker. Uh, but yes, yeah, three out of the three out of the top four extensions for Visual Studio Code are um, are Python related. Yeah, I like the. I think we learned this from the open source community that Microsoft, <laughs> of course, had Visual Studio, which right. is great. But oh my gosh, it's really really heavy because it does everything. <laughs> and most people don't want to do everything. They right. they want to do this these three four five things. And uh, so a lot of that functionality was wasted, and uh, and VS Code is, as you said, is boring by itself. It's just a, <laughs> it's just a shell that you can plug right. in the things that you need to do, which was what the open source community has been doing for years. <laughs> well, and and also and and also Python developers and many and many other languages, they um, many of them they'll have uh, like a Vim background, and they'll have that minimalist. They don't want like like you said, it it you know Visual Studio. Not only is it and, and again, again, I'm not. And again, I'm not putting down Visual Studio. If you if you are a Wintel.net developer, everything. <laughs> Win, Visual Studio is for you. In fact, I've seen you know, I, I've seen people complain about the, you know, the C how the C sharp support in Visual Studio Code is kind of lacking in some ways. Hmm. But um, I, I, you know, the, the C sharp that I do, I found I found it actually to be fantastic. But the other thing that I like about Visual Studio Code as opposed to um, Visual Studio is I work across platforms. So I mean I'm on Windows okay, right yeah. now, but I do a lot of development on a Mac and even sometimes Linux, and it works right. almost identically across platforms. I mean it's fantastic. The extensions you install an extension in one and the other nice thing about this is the extension sync. So you can so you can sync your extensions across your different installations. So if, so oh, if I nice. so if I so if I oh there's my it knows phone. that you're a, a, a Jupyter Notebooks guy and so it'll install it onto your different machines. Hang on just a second. Let me kill my phone here. It's probably the fake IRS. <laughs> uh, they like to call me. I already got a call. I already got a call from Amazon telling me that, <laughs> telling me that my, telling me that my, um, I'm telling me that my 13-inch um, iMac Pro is on the way. But at any rate, um, <laughs> good deal. <laughs> but no, um, but no. So so so. In other words, what I can do is I can install a new extension. While I'm working on Windows, and the next time when I go to my Mac, it's there. It's there. Yeah, it uh, it and on you. GitHub Code Spaces, GitHub oh, Code Spaces. That, cool. yeah. that 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 is the coolest thing, um, is uh, because that's like Visual, you know, it's Visual Studio Code running in the browser, backed by uh, backed by a Linux virtual machine. Again, Linux there. Uh, Microsoft loves Linux, and um, even if I sign in, even if I sign into GitHub Code Spaces, I can you know I can have those you know. Not all the extensions, you know, not all the extensions work, or, you know, it would work on in the browser, but um, would be relevant. But yeah, and then uh, and then again, another thing that recently, so I actually um, until about six weeks ago, I had resisted um, upgrading to Windows 11, and one reason was because all the audio equipment I was kind of worried about comp about compatibility. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that um, the one thing that finally convinced me, that finally pushed me over the edge was the new uh, WSL features in Windows 11. So it's Windows Subsystem for Linux, right. which basically it's a it's a it's a kind of a native virtualization. I, I I'm probably describing it terribly, but it lets you run. Um, it, it's an out of the box solution included with Windows for running Linux virtual machines, and it is fantastic. 
Um, and the thing that I like about using this with Visual Studio Code is that um, it, it's very simple. It's just an extension uh, for Visual Studio Code. They'll see all the WSL instances that you have on your machine. And uh, but what I like about it is for each one, you can actually have a different set of extensions because hmm, um, what I found is that Visual Studio Code, um, you know, there's 30,000 extensions out there. It's very easy to get over 100 of them that you want to use. And it doesn't really slow it down, but I have found that there are there can be conflicts sometimes. And so that's what's really nice about um, WSL or, or connecting really to any virtual machine. Um, you know, so you can connect to a Linux virtual machine running on Azure and still and still do and still do something similar. But uh, I, I use this really <clears throat> I use this extensively with with uh, WSL because um, it, it take it takes no time whatsoever to spin want to spin up a new one. Uh, they don't really take up, I mean, I can have several running at one time and they don't really take up a whole lot of memory. And for each one of them though, I can have, um, and that's also something else that's, that's really cool about code spaces is there's a file um, that you can include called, a, is it devcontainer.json, I believe. And it basically um, configures, the, it basically configures your, your development environment. And um, you can also include in there um, the extensions that you want. So what you could do is, so what you could do is you could have a, a GitHub repo out there and you put a uh, you put a dev .json file in there and somebody could then fork um, that uh, fork that um, repository, create a code space from that repository and it'll look at that and it'll look at that um, dev .json file and it will set it up so that you don't have to you don't have to go through and configure any extensions or, or right. anything and it's just it's just really it's just Very it's nice. just really it's just really amazing and you can still like i said you know most of the extensions will work so if you so so the so the exact same azure tools extensions that you have on your desktop you'll have in in, in uh you'll have in github code spaces or on or if you switch to a mac or whatever or in w w windows subsystem for linux it doesn't matter very cool wow we're going all over the map here yeah <laughs> i want i want to i want to talk to you a little bit more about uh, python and azure mm -hmm. is there anything that um you cannot do in Azure with Python that uh, that you think that we ought to be able to do. Um, well, there are some there are some services that are not available. Um, for example, the SignalR service that's that's obviously you know that's obviously going to be going to be ASP.NET only. Okay. Um, but you could every... do that without Python anywhere. Are there things that you can do with Python, say, uh, locally that that just aren't supported in Azure? Um, well, some. I mean, I guess. I guess one thing might be uh, uh, GUI applications. That's something that's going to be um, uh, that's going to be local only. Of course, of course, you could you know you, you can definitely access Azure services from a you know from a GUI application running locally. Um, that's ki that, that's kind of that, but I believe you know I believe that's kind of stretching it, saying that you can't run GUI applications in Azure because you can't really run GUI Windows applications in Azure either, unless you're on of course a, a, a Windows see. VM. Right. Um, I haven't really experimented a lot with running. Um, and if you and if you were running an Azure VM, you were running Windows in an Azure VM, then you could, of course, run Python GUI applications there. Mm -hmm. um, but no, again, like I said, um, everything that I've needed to everything that I've needed to do, I've been able to do, uh, and and many times more. Uh, Microsoft has really like i said it's really has really embraced python and it's not a surprise because like i said they were embracing python even even before they went more back, in, back in the iron python days <laughs> yeah yeah oh yes iron <laughs> i was i was super into iron python really um in fact you were i was the one <laughs> oh i'm sorry you were the one <laughs> yeah that's actually still maintained if i'm not mistaken is it really? i believe I it is still i believe it is still maintained years. but i was really so so of course you remember, uh, you, of course you remember Silverlight. Um, everybody and and Silver and Silverlight was absolutely fantastic. Um, Silverlight, which is actually the which is actually the basis for .NET Core in some ways. But um, I remember, do you remember a project called Gestalt with, with Silverlight? It was basically, in some ways, I don't want to say a predecessor to Blazor, but basically what it was it was allow, it allowed you to to write you via Silverlight to script web pages using Iron Python and Iron Ruby. Oh, really? Essentially, is what it was, and uh, it, it was it was it was really it never it never really went anywhere, but um, it was really cool. But it was really cool. Mm. Yeah. Um. Very cool. Well, we talked about a lot of stuff. Tell me about some of the um the courses and the and the, that you have coming up. 
Uh, so um, <clears throat> right now, <laughs> well, so right now, um, on actually on plural side, I'm I'm actually we're actually talking about some Python ones now that um have haven't, haven't been published yet. Um, but I did uh I actually did quite a, actually did quite a bit of mobile over the over the last two two, two years or so. But hmm. um you know, I've done I've done things with uh, it's mainly in the data science uh, community. Got a really popular actually got a really popular course that um hopefully will soon be updated um about um Jupyter Notebook. And then, um, as far as and, and with Real Python, I uh, just published a course about a really cool framework called Fast API. Um, it's one that uh, it's getting it's it's gaining steam. It's very new. I think twenty eighteen is when it was released. Mm -hmm. But um, and it's and it's, and it's uh, one of the nice things about it, it supports async. If you've ever used async, the async I/O module uh, or package in um no the module yeah because it comes to the python standard library um inside in inside of python um it's it's it, you know it's, it's it's a whole async await pattern you know you know c sharp and a lot of others yep. and now javascript or typescript rather supports it and um it's actually interesting i read that um something about i think it may have come from guido himself who i did not realize until a couple of months ago works for microsoft now that the creator of python works for microsoft i did <laughs> not realize that until a couple of months ago did that until just yeah summer. Yeah, he, yeah, you need, need to need, need to bring him, need to bring him down to Memphis also sometime. Uh, yeah, get but on it, my show. yeah, <laughs> hey, yeah, there you go. Uh, but um, and he said, I believe it was it was Guido, but it was one of, it was one of the steer, it was one of the people who are steering the language right now. Said they actually took a lot of inspiration, especially in type hinting from TypeScript. What? Hmm. But um, you know, the whole async await pattern, and the, the way that it works in Python can be it's a little different. And for, and you know in Fast API, however, allows you. It's a it's basically an async web framework for working with um, for for creating uh, REST APIs, and so so you know and there's things out there like Django that has the DRF, but uh, DRF or which is Django REST framework, but DRF kind of try Django is very opinionated. It has its own way that it expects you to create a web application because it was created right. for the forms over data information delivery style applications. And while DRF works, it basically tries to try, try, tries to force you to create a REST API in that in that style of application that it expects, and something like uh, so it's kind of a bolt-on. In other words, an afterthought. But Fast API is from is from the beginning um, for for um, for REST APIs, and also it um, and also it, wor it works with async. Of course, now everything you know you, you all the all the cool kids nowadays are async. Oh, uh, so the web, uh, you have to deal with the latency of the web. And oh, oh yeah, <laughs> right. And um, and I've got so, several other courses on there related to uh, data science and machine and machine learning. And like I said, I'm work work. I'm working on some other stuff. Um, I'm working on some other stuff as well that uh, that I'm that I'm self that I'm self publishing. Excellent. Well, Douglas, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. I always learn something new. So <laughs> thanks for giving us a few minutes today. All right, thanks for having me, David. I appreciate it. You Good to see safe. you. As a technology professional, you are able to benefit from participating in an active community. And you won't just meet new colleagues in the community, you'll make new friends. This is important with in-person events starting back up. Check Meetup and LinkedIn to see what community events, user groups, and conferences are coming up near you.